So I can see that we do have attendees arriving, which is excellent. Welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna give it a few minutes as we're expecting a lot of people. So um, welcome to this first of our fall education series. My name is Jamie Myra. I'm the executive director here at the Pulmonary Hypertension Association of Canada. Um, we are joined today by several panelists who I'll introduce to you in a moment. But in the meantime, we'll just give um, everybody a chance to come on in and get settled. And I'll turn my cell phone off. How's that? <laughs> turn my ringer off. Yeah, we've uh, still got a minute to go before our start time. So we'll just give everybody a few minutes to, um, to arrive. I can uh, report today that it's a beautiful day in Vancouver. We're having a lovely uh, week of sort of the end of summer, beginning of fall where our trees are turning. We had horrible rain last week and this week we have nothing but sunshine. So we're being spoiled. It's really great. I hope that uh, it's nice in other parts of the country. Jeanette, how is it looking in Nova Scotia today? Absolutely beautiful. Uh, from, I, think, I think your view is pretty much always beautiful, even in a, <laughs> Perhaps even in a first game. <laughs> yes. Uh, Joanne is here with me in Vancouver. Carolyn, how about you? What is it like in Ottawa today? And overcast now, the sun's trying to peek out and it's, I think, stopped raining. Good, good, good. Well, it's definitely been a change of season. We are firmly into fall. We launched it this year with, uh, with our um, new uh, summer issue of uh, Connections, which was hopefully arrived in your mailboxes last week. The theme of that issue was pH and mental health. And it was that issue of Connections that really inspired us to follow up with this first uh, session um, on facing mental health issues as people affected by pulmonary hypertension, whether somebody with a diagnosis of pH or a, a caregiver or a loved one of pH, those that are affected by pH um, are at an increased risk uh, of facing mental health challenges, at, such as things like depression and anxiety, as we saw in this recent issue of Connections. And so today we wanted to take the opportunity to delve further into some of those stories of families that are affected by pH, some of the things that they experience, and, um, and hear from our panel of experts on sort of their reflections, their thoughts, their advice for, for how um, people can um, approach these issues in a, in, a, in a healthy way and hopefully, um, you know, build resiliency in, in being able to deal with some of the things that life throws at us, whether we live with a chronic illness like pH sometimes or not. So I'm seeing that we have several dozen people with us. We are expecting more folks, um, but it is 12.01, so we're going to get started. I'm going to do my best here to keep an eye on um, the questions and the chat box. We've got Sally, our education coordinator, who's also helping in the background with the, with the questions. You can and ask questions at any point during the session because they will be submitted in writing and, uh, and we'll um, be able to answer them at the, at the most appropriate time. Also, for those of you who might be joining us from Quebec or other parts of the country, please feel free to submit questions in French as well. And we've got some help from Laurence, our communications coordinator, who's gonna be able to help um, ask and answer some questions in French if necessary. So first, to get us started, again, let me, uh, hi Jazz, I see your hello there, uh, welcome. Um, I'm gonna start by introducing our panel. So we have with us today, uh, Jeanette McKean, who's with us from Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Jeanette uh, lives with pulmonary arterial hypertension and scleroderma, and recently wrote the introduction for our special feature on mental health and pH uh, for Connections Magazine. She's also a retired counselor, and, uh, and so she brings with her both some lived experience expertise as well as some professional expertise for this, uh, this topic today. Welcome, Jeanette. We also have with us Carolyn Doyle-Cox, who is well known in the PH community. Carolyn is uh, the PH nurse at the Ottawa PH Clinic and is also a founding member of the Canadian PH Professionals Network, the, the nurses network uh, that supports PH nurses across the country and uh, is also a former board member of PHA Canada. Welcome, Carolyn. And 
Third, we have Joanne Schwartz. Joanne was, um, is, is, is not a stranger to some parts of the PH community. She's well known to some of us out here in Vancouver as she is a local social worker and counselor who also acts as a counselor to folks at the Vancouver PH clinic. So some of you may know Joanne quite well. Um, so she brings with her, again, again, both expertise in mental health as well as some expertise or experience working with folks specifically in the PH community, which is really great. Thank you so much for joining us, Joanne. So uh, now we want to get to know you guys a little bit better. So we're going to have two polls. Um, they're going to show up on your screen and you're going to be asked to answer two questions and then scroll all the way to the bottom and hit the submit button. So Sally, you can go ahead and launch the polls. The first poll is just to get a sense of uh, where folks are from in the country. So the first question is to uh, which Canadian province do you live in? So you can, um, the provinces are there in alphabetical order, find your province and then scroll on down to the second question. And the second question is um, an agreement statement, agree, disagree with the statement, uh, I have the tools and resources I need for taking care of my mental health. Just so you know, these polls are being done anonymously. So you're not, um, you're not being identified when you ask or answer these particular questions. And also, during the session, when you're asking questions, if you want to, you can actually ask those questions anonymously, anonymously when you submit questions as well. So we'll just give people another few minutes to, or another moment to answer these two questions. And then when you're done, when you get to the very bottom, you can uh, hit submit. We've got about 70% of people have voted so far. Let's get to 75 and then we'll hopefully, everybody will participate, but we'll give everybody another moment. All right. Oh, how did it go down? How did we lose some people? Oh, because new people joined. We have new people who have joined us. Oh. <laughs> just joined us. I was like, how is our percentage going down? If you just joined us, we're just doing a poll to get started to find out where you're from and uh, sort of how you're feeling going into today's session. So if you have a second, try and answer the two questions on the screen in front of you and then scroll to the bottom and hit submit. All right, we'll just give it one more moment here. All right, Sally, I think you can end the poll now. Great, thank you. All right, let's share these results. So we've got 58% of our people here are from Ontario. Welcome everybody in Central Canada. And then we've got another 27% of folks here from Alberta, or sorry, from BC, and a few more folks from Alberta. Prince Edward Island, a few people in Quebec, welcome, bonjour everybody, uh, and nobody yet from the prairies, but who knows, some people still might join us um, throughout the session. All right, let's look at the second question, the second, or sorry, the second question in the poll, which was the question, how much do you agree or disagree with the statement? I have the tools and resources I need for taking care of my mental health. 19% strongly agree. That's amazing, that's really great. I really am very happy to hear that. Uh, and then another 42% uh, state that they agree that they have the tools and resources they need for taking care of their mental health. That's wonderful news. But there are still some people who are not feeling quite as confident. We've got some people feel, you know, feeling a bit neutral about this. And then some people you know, disagree or even strongly disagree that they don't feel like they have all the tools and resources they need. All right, well, that's really interesting. So thanks, Sally, for those polls. So now that we have a little bit of a sense of you folks, um, I'll give you just a bit more information about what our goals are here today. So today, these are our objectives really in, in having this session today. Part of it is to reduce the shame and stigma that can be associated with mental health issues and talking about those things um, in our peer communities. Part of it is to explore strategies with these, uh, these experts we have with us today, with each other for facing our emotions and dealing with mental health issues in our lives. 
Um, some of it is to provide information on mental health resources, which we're going to do after um, we speak with our presenters about some stories. And then the last is to encourage care for ourselves and for the people that we love. So those are the things that we're aiming to do today. Uh, we certainly don't expect that we'll be able to solve any one person's, you know, problems today. And uh, the way that we're going to approach this is to use some uh, stories or what we call case studies that um, represent very kind of typical experiences or sort of common experiences within the pH um, community. So they're not meant to represent any one or two or three individuals. So if there are resemblances that you see in these stories for people you know or for yourself, um, you know, those are, are really coincidences. They're, you know, the stories were designed to be relatable, but they really aren't uh, uh, based on any, you know, one or, um, or any particular people. So uh, the purpose for that was so that we would, could allow our experts to have a conversation about these situations uh, without worrying about anybody's privacy. So the, what we're going to do is we're going to have three stories and we're going to give our, our panelists an opportunity to discuss and respond to those stories and then we're going to open it up to you guys as well for questions. Uh, so you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions uh, when we go through each of the stories and then we're also going to have an opportunity if we have some time uh, to open it up for questions at the end as well. If we don't get to all your questions um, then we'll talk about opportunities for how you can um, we can follow up with you after today's session since we only have about an hour. Uh, so with that I am going to jump into our first story and our stories today are brought to us by recording by some familiar faces from the PH community. So here is our first one. For long periods and often. Oh, let's make it go from the beginning. Case study number one, pandemic dilemma. Shania is a 31 year old single mom from Surrey, BC. She was diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension four years ago when she had her daughter, Linda. Shania worked as a manager at a local grocery store but left her job over concerns for her health and safety during the pandemic. Her government aid is ending and she urgently needs to either find another job or risk going back to her previous one. At the same time, she's worried her pH is getting worse. She's unable to stand for long periods and often feels dizzy. Her parents live in Toronto and were planning to visit her earlier this year, but are now stuck in Ontario. If she finds a new job, she'll need to find new daycare for Linda which will further increase their risk of exposure to COVID-19. But even without a job, she's not sure she has the energy to care for Linda by herself. I'm scared to go back to work and to send Linda to daycare, but I also don't know if I could care for her by myself, even if I didn't have to work. I really don't know what to do. I feel so all alone, Shania said. Shania is under great stress. How can she cope with that stress in order to better manage the problems that she is facing? Case study number one, pet fin feels dizzy. All right, let's just review that question again and then I'll uh, replace the slide with our presenters. So the story there was about a single mom named Shania and we learned a lot about some stress that's going on in her life. And the question is, how can she cope with that stress in order to better manage some of the problems that she is facing? So with that, I'm going to put our presenters back on the screen. And we're going to start with you, Jeanette. Um, what, what comes to mind for you when you hear this story? And, and what sort of advice or thoughts would you have for somebody in this situation? Well, the first thing that I would suggest to you, Shanae, is that she consult with her pH specialist, particularly about the fear she has about her illness. Um, it's getting worse according to what she feels. And I believe that some of her stress could be lessened by knowing what her physical wellness is at this time. And I think that's the very first thing I, as a PAH patient myself, would do. Uh, by knowing this, uh, it, it could be that she uh, needs an adjustment or change in her medication, uh, which could change the course of her illness. And just a good, honest chat with her specialist could do wonders for her. I know as a pH pa patient myself, 
That is my first line of defense. Get in touch with my PAH clinic. Uh, because I think a lot of her stress uh, would be alleviated if she knew exactly where she stands with that. Mm -hmm. Much of the stress is, seems to be around her PAH and it's worsening. And maybe that's not what's happening at all. Uh, that's what it appears to her. Um, this in turn impacts her coping, coping mechanisms about her work and her caring for her daughter. There also appears to be no light at the end of her tunnel. Finding a good therapist to talk to is something that I really think that she should look at as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Self-care is uh, very important, and doing something for herself is probably at the bottom of her list. Perhaps a day away with a friend, with her daughter, having a play date with a friend, a little friend where COVID precautions are being adhered to so that she doesn't have any worries. And I think this pandemic is something that is worrying a lot of us with PAH. I know it certainly is with me but I try to be reasonable about it too. Now, mind you, I live in the maritime bubble, like the Atlantic bubble, and we're pretty safe down here so far. And I know that's not the way it is everywhere. And with her feeling all alone, or so alone with her parents visiting, um, I think if she did some uh, searching out in her community and looked for resources, uh, that would help her in the uh, looking at for daycare for her daughter, if that needs to be the thing that she has to do, if she has to go back to work. Helping her find daycare, uh, social contacts. Uh, often other mothers are feeling exactly the same way. And she could have great discussions with them. They could be a help to each other. And with her experience as a, a manager, perhaps she may be able to find work in a comparable field that um, she wouldn't have to be so physically involved like she was in her last job. Mm -hmm. And perhaps she has to go back to her last job. She could have conversations with her, with her bosses to see if there's something that could be done so that she would not be so physically active. I think her first line of defense is go see her PAH specialist before she does anything else. And I think a lot of this would help with her stress level. So carefully, as Jeanette has pointed out, there, you know, there's a lot of options facing somebody in a situation like this. If their first stop is their PH clinic, um, you know, how would you approach a situation like this where somebody has got so many different stressors and is really starting to feel the weight of that um, and feel sort of hopeless in that situation? Um, there's, you know, like what things to do when you're feeling the stressors? Is that yeah, how are you going to approach supporting a patient who's in that situation who, like Jeanette says, is going to come maybe first to their pH clinic, is going to reach out to their pH clinic, you know, in this situation? Um, well, certainly, you know, did you want me to go into, because the second, um, our second case kind of talks about some of that stressor stuff or? No, it's okay. You can respond to this one as well if you'd like. Yeah. Um, well, I... Saying? Sorry, go ahead. Did you say I said, or what Jeanette was saying, or Joanne, did you have anything that you wanted to add to what Jeanette, Jeanette was saying? Um, well, I wanted to, um, to, to uh, point out, initially you had called us all experts, and I, I don't always feel like an expert in mental health, and that, that I think is like an important thing to remember. Um, Right. And when we did that poll, you asked, you know, do we strongly agree we have the tools um, to deal with our mental health? And again, that also depends on the day. So even hearing this case study, I feel stressed like this is a really stressful situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think Jeanette covered a lot of things. My, I, I agree, too. It would be important to check in with her medical team to see, like, is she progressing in her disease or is that like a, just a, an extension of her anxiety around everything else that's going on? Um, I think the pandemic is really stressful for everyone, um, and it's really heightened by um, having a chronic illness. And further to that, having a four-year-old, I have a four-year-old, and it, like, it is exhausting 
So yeah. I, I think she has totally legitimate reasons to feel stressed right now. Um, mm -hmm. The social work practical side of me would say like, <clears throat> depending on what her pH specialists say, maybe she needs to consider going on to disability. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe working isn't good right now for her and then she can focus her energy on caring for her daughter. Um, potentially a job where she's not standing on her feet or maybe there's a way of her going back part-time. Maybe there's a, like a different setup for her. Um, I get that she's concerned about exposure for uh, being in the grocery store. And then in addition, if her daughter goes into daycare, not to mention even the cost of daycare, but... Um, Sorry, that's me at work. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I was going to say something brilliant. Now I can't remember. No. <laughs> oh, uh, if she is really worried about exposure at daycare, maybe if she does go back to work, a nanny is like a better bet for her or someone where it's like, you know, one person coming into home and connecting with her child. But again, I think Jeanette yeah. um, made a really good point, reaching out to her supports, other, other moms, like having a four-year-old without a pandemic and job insecurity is a really stressful time. So there's other people who are stressed and struggling as well. What can they do to support each other? What is the situation with their community? Are there other people who can help out? Um, yeah. I assume dad is not in the picture, but maybe there is someone who can kind of take her daughter for a few hours a day to give her a chance to rest. Uh, those are some of the main things. I know her parents are stuck in Ontario, but is that, is that long-term? Are they gonna be able to come out and help? Um, would maybe moving back closer to family be a better choice long-term if she feels like overwhelmed by what's going on um, in yeah. her area? So yeah. just some thoughts. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have, um, you know, in Ontario, I don't know if every province is different. Um, I certainly put a few people at work. Um, we have, we have written letters that uh, people need to stay at home, but people, there are, financial, um, there's financial help for people here in this province. So I'm not sure what's available in BC. She is a single mom. Um, we've encouraged everybody to stay home. We've encouraged people that especially in a grocery store um, to, to, to not work if you're working in, you know, with large amounts of people in and out. Um, so, so I don't, you know, obviously every province is a little different. So I can't speak to the financial help that people would get in BC, but our patients, at least here, um, they've been able to um, get money every month. Uh, I, I forget what the different program is. Somebody here in Ontario might be able to help me um, that's uh, visiting with us today on this webinar. Uh, you know, we, we don't encourage people to be out working, that's for sure. Um, we, we know that um, anybody that gets um, this COVID with pulmonary hypertension is at higher risk. Um, for being much more unwell. So that, you know, that's what I would do, except I know it's here in Ontario, it's a little different in what, what our patients have available to them if they, you know, for funding. Yeah. Okay. Folks can ask questions anytime, but given, um, given our, that we're short on time today, let's also go on to our second our second story. Here we go. Lucy, a 39-year-old woman from Winnipeg, was recently diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension. She and her husband, John, have two lovely children, a five-year-old boy, Skye, and a three-year-old girl, Victoria. Lucy works full-time as a dental hygienist and greatly appreciates the friendly atmosphere of her office. After one year of fatigue and chest pain, she reached out for medical help and was diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Soon afterwards, she began to undergo substantial medical treatment and had to stop working full time. In addition, because of her severe symptoms, such as not being able to stand for long periods of time, she became unable to look after her two children. John took more family responsibilities on his shoulders, worked longer hours, and spent more time taking care of the kids. 
Lucy is very grateful to have the support from John and her heart is also filled with sorrow for her family. Am I a good mom and wife? Lucy has begun to blame and question herself every day, especially in reaction to her doctor saying that pulmonary arterial hypertension may shorten her lifespan. She feels guilt about her situation and is now facing depression. It's just snowballing. I really don't know how to make things better, Lucy said. Lucy is feeling hopeless. How can she shift her perspective and address her depression? Hmm. So much happening upon a new diagnosis. So as we've heard, Lucy is feeling hopeless. How can she shift her perspective and address her perspective? or sorry, her depression. So we're gonna start with you, Carolyn. You've, I'm sure you, you, know, you see these sorts of situations all the time. Um, you know, what are some of the strategies you use to support someone in a situation like this? Um, in the very beginning of diagnosis, it's a lot for people to um, swallow. And um, especially as time goes on and they realize maybe I can't work you know, I've tried, I try to work and I can't. And then, you know, sometimes people get very, you know, it's a burden. So it starts off with a, a, the burden and you certainly don't want a burden to develop into an anxiety or a depression. Um, so in the beginning, if you're noticing that, um, that, you know, recognize you are not alone. And some of the, you know, important things are organizations like PJ Canada um, and support groups, like the, reaching out, um, speaking to others that may be in your same situation. Sometimes these types of things, um, you know, feeling down, feeling hopeless or worthless uh, last weeks, months, but if you're really, we certainly wouldn't want anything like that to snowball into a real clinical depression. And, um, you know, so if you've tried things like exercise as best you can, maybe some, some light yoga, some mindfulness, um, things like that, if, you, if you're really feeling that this is not helping, um, then you really need to do reach out to your family doctor um, because you certainly wouldn't want to go into a clinical depression untreated. So, so reaching out, reaching out to people that maybe have similar um, diagnosis as you, um, opening up to your spouse, opening up to friends and family, and, um, and trying some exercise that you can do. If that does not work, I, I tend to tell people that you, can, you should reach out to your family doctor. Um, some patients have trouble, uh, they may not have insurance for psychology, um, but there are some also very uh, low cost type um, psychologists out there, usually through the universities or um, through, through different things like charity. Uh, you know, the, the churches, the, your church might have somebody. So um, first I, I'd say try to reach out. Then I'd say try to reach out to your GP if nothing is, is helping. I'm Joanne, I imagine you speak to lots of newly diagnosed patients. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you see here uh, that help help folks uh, get over this part of their or get through this part of their journey? Um, well, everyone's everyone's journey is so different, right? So, and it depends on your support system, depends what's going on. Um, for Lucy, I would say though, she seems to be really having lost her identity. Um, working in the dental hygiene office and, and kind of as the main person in the household who did a lot of the chores and things like that. And so she probably has to grieve that things are changing. Um, the part that really struck me was wondering if she's a good, a good wife or partner and a good mother. And I think not enough people acknowledge that everyone feels like that at some times. So um, the big thing that would jump out for me is really yeah, communicating with John. Um, I'm sure if this situation were reversed and he was the one who were ill, she would be taking care of him. Um, and that's, that's what we have to do in relationships. Um, I, the practical side of me wonders, like, can they afford some help? Is there some um, practical relief can they get? You know, uh, is there, does she have any other support systems? Are there people that can sort of step up? Um, does she have any extended health through her, um, her previous job? 
uh, maybe that could cover some sort of counseling because I agree this is like an important time to really assess whether this is a situational depression based on all the changes in her life or is there something deeper going on um, and a bit of a chemical imbalance. And I think that um, I think that the more, again, we talk about mental health and acknowledge this is something we all go through, the more um, common it is to acknowledge also getting support for it. So those are just some ideas off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Jeanette, what resonates for you here the most? Well, really, what really struck me is the uh, when she said that her uh, doctor told her it would be life shortening. I had the exact same thing said to me when I was diagnosed. And uh, my first thought was going down into a slump, of course, and thinking, well, this is it. You know, I'm in my, well, I'm, I guess I was 69 when I was diagnosed. I thought, well, this is the end kind of thing. And then when I got out of the doctor's office and went home and started thinking about it, I thought, just watch me. I'm not going to let this get me down. And one of the first things I started to do was uh, do some journaling. And I got all my feelings and my thoughts about it on a piece of paper. And I would suggest to her that that's what she, you know, part of her uh, getting through this is to do that. And for me, it was a, a great cleansing because I sort of went through what my life had been up until this particular point in time. And what could I do to make it better from now on? And uh, it, it, it really, really worked wonders for me. And I also decided at that point that uh, self-care was, was another thing that I was really going to be doing. From the point of view of whether it was going out to have lunch with a friend, uh, have my nails done, have my picture, but things like that. And those things really helped build me up when I, because that was really something, you know, I thought, well, I'm almost at the end of my life. And here he's telling me I'm at the end pretty well. And I thought, no, I'm not gonna let that be what, what my future is. So eight and a half years later, I'm still here and I'm still doing as well as I was the day that he told me that. And part of that, as I say, was a lot of journaling. And also I looked at myself from a, it, where my faith was, if I had spirituality, and I would suggest that that's a good way to, to look at it too. If you are a spiritual person or a faith-filled person, whatever, uh, tap in on that as well. Particularly in journaling, because nobody has to see it. You know, it's your story, it's your feelings at that particular time. And I was also fortunate to have a therapist at that time too, that I used to see just to bounce things off. And I think that's really helpful too. Not just your family doctor, but somebody that you can just go and sit and talk to uh, as a counselor, therapist, whatever, if that is available to her. So those were my coping mechanisms as a PAH patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just lost Carolyn. I was just going to ask her to follow up on her comment about support groups, but maybe I'll just step in and, and reflect on what, I, what I've experienced. You know, I've worked in community-based health uh, for, well, 25 years, but, I, you know, in the five years that I've been here in the PH community, you know, I see, a, you know, thinking about new diagnosis, you know, the, the, the real value that support groups hold for people. And, you know, of course, in, you know, we have a traditional model of support groups that often includes in-person meetings. And we still have several of those groups in the country that, uh, you know, that operate that, that up, you know, up until COVID were operating really regularly. And, you know, we've seen groups have to be a bit more flexible with the pandemic to meeting online. Um, but we've also, seen the, the, the strength and the importance of those online support groups that have been created over the years. And so, you know, we have that within the PH community quite strongly on Facebook. And, um, and so, and I've seen, you know, I, I see it all the time, but especially recently just being reminded of the importance of those peer environments and those opportunities to connect with people who, you know, truly get it and, you know, been, you know, been down the road that you're on and, and 
to be able to connect with those people in an environment that has some privacy and um, some space to it where you can, you know, kind of bring your whole self and, you know, be vulnerable and, uh, and have the, some of those difficult conversations. Carolyn, we were just talking about support groups because you, you brought up the importance of support groups uh, and yeah. we're thinking specifically in the context of new diagnosis, but did you, was there anything else you wanted to say about support groups? I mean, we have such a fabulous support group and, um, you know, they're, they're run by a patient and a caregiver uh, and I join every month. You know, they, what's been amazing to me is not only are they um, a, a great support group when we used to get together physically once a month, um, but they, they, right now we have a few that just reach out and call everybody to see how you're doing. Um, so just check in. And uh, so, so those are very important, I, I find, because you're there with people who have your same diagnosis, who take the same medications, who understand how you feel. And, you know, that's a place to start as long as, um, you know, you're, you're able to lift up from that. You know, if you can't, you have to recognize that as well and when to reach out for more help. Um, but they are super fabulous to have a support group. So we, we do, you know, because we have been so successful, if anybody across the country really wants to reach out to anybody in our group, we're more than happy to speak to you as to how, you know, we got that started. Right now, we're going to be doing a lot of that through um, um, Zoom meetings like this. So we're going to pick up and have them again um, virtually. Yeah. So we have a comment in the in the chat from from Taria and Taria here in Vancouver. Hi, Taria. Uh, she she mentions you know that you know we're all getting so used to and comfortable working on this format of video conferencing and Zoom now. Uh, she's interested in perhaps reviving the Vancouver support group, maybe extending it to folks elsewhere in BC. And uh, and so the answer to your question, Tari, is yes, we can absolutely help you set that up, help you get the word out. And uh, and so for others in other parts of the country, if you you know you want to like you like she says leverage this opportunity of us all needing and wanting and, and, and benefiting from these virtual connections with each other and you're interested in setting something up in your you know in your own area of the country or with your own peer group um, PHA Canada absolutely has the tools to help you do that we have video conferencing lines for folks who don't have access to those tools already um, you know and then we have lots and lots of communications channels where we can help get the word out to other other people in the community who had to, to join you so uh, yeah we're very happy to help do that um, all right. So Can I jump in there one second. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of clients who say who are not who are really reticent to join support groups because they mm -hmm. say, oh, maybe I'm not as sick as some of the other people there. Or what if it's going to be depressing because everyone just complains the whole time. And, and I try and say like, you know, it's going to be like being in a workplace, you're not going to like every single person you come across, but maybe you'll connect with one or two people that you feel like you can have a long lasting relationship with. And it's good to know you're not the only person going through these things. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. And I, yes, I, you know, support groups are not always for everybody, but I think what I've also seen is that there's sort of different types of support groups so you know not all support groups are the same either and so we've got some questions here one question is whether or not there are support groups in Ontario there are actually uh, a couple of very active support groups uh, one in uh, in uh, Ottawa with a Carolyn was just mentioning and there's another really active one in London there was a support group in Toronto that's not active anymore but uh, again with sort of COVID times um, there's opportunities perhaps to expand some of these groups um, to be more inclusive others in the area and I see Jessica saying that she'd be interested in helping in, in Edmonton which is awesome that's just oh, my right that's Carolyn no that's okay we'll ignore that back uh, the what I was gonna say is um, we'll put it in the notes um, but uh, there's on our website if you go to the support section of PHA Canada's website you will see a list of all of the active support groups in the country both the ones that have previously met in person as well as the ones that are active online so there's many many groups that have uh, Facebook groups and things like that so we will um, make sure that we put the link in the notes um, but you can always go to our website for more information about that. All right, so let's move on to our final story. Brought to us by Nicole. George, a 51-year-old man from Hamilton, is a caregiver to his wife, Jin, whom suffers from PH, scleroderma, and lung cancer. 
They raised three lovely kids who have now all recently moved out from home. George and Jin have finally time to take a break from their decades of duties as responsible parents. However, at the beginning of 2018, Jin was diagnosed with PAH. Things happened very quickly. She started not being able to cook, grocery shop, or do other errands. George soon began to help as much as he could, although he had never cooked in the past, nor done the grocery shopping. In addition, he also supported Jin at healthcare appointments, assisted with medical treatments, and provided her with comfort and support. He became very overwhelmed and was hardly able to take a break from his duties. George knows he needs to take a break, but he just can't stop a fear of losing his wife, Jin. He loves Jin greatly and refuses to mention a word of his difficulties to her. Watching her suffer from the disease brings George immense pain. Despite his love for Jin, George finds that he can now even lose his temper over small things, which he would never do in the past. George feels great guilt and perceives that his life is now in a hopeless cycle of work and worry without any way forward. How can we help George? George, a 50... So we just learned a lot about George and his circumstances and how he feels great guilt. He perceives that his life is now a hopeless cycle of work and worry. How can we help him move forward? So I'm gonna to come to you to start, Joanne. How can we help George? Um, I think again, this would be a good opportunity for support groups around caregiver support groups, right? So recognizing that people, um, other people are going through what you are and you're not alone. Um, I understand that he's feeling depressed. This is not how he imagined their empty nest years once their kids left. Um, and it's really sad. Um, I, I would imagine some of his irritability and short temperedness is related to, you know, a depression that he's going through because he's just so overwhelmed and exhausted. Um, we talk about, you know, compassion fatigue or caregiver burnout, and it sounds like he is really struggling. Um, again, the practical side of me thinks, you know, okay, he's overwhelmed. What are things that can be done to help? If she can't grocery shop anymore, maybe they can get grocery delivery. Um, maybe there's pre-made meals if cooking isn't something he feels comfortable in. Like there's some things that can reduce some of their stress. Uh, talking to someone about what he's going through, I think would be really key. And um, they raised three lovely kids. Uh, where are those kids? Maybe they can yeah. help out now. Very <laughs> um, young. I mean, he's 51. I imagine she's young too. So uh, if they have kids that are out of the house, can they help with taking her to some of the appointments or um, give him a break and spend some time with her? And at least then he would feel like she's being in really good hands. Um, those are just my initial thoughts. Carolyn, what else uh, came to mind for you? So that was my thing too. Um, I sometimes uh, you have to kind of figure out how, how is somebody behaving as the nurse or the doctor? Is this somebody who has a lot of pride and doesn't want to speak about it? And is you know, obviously suffering in silence. So they're not going to say they're having these issues. Um, so that's really hard because then you don't know if you, how to help somebody who's not telling you, but if you can, if you tend to see a patient in clinic often with their family member and you recognize that somebody looks like they might be coming a bit, um, you know, having a lot of caregiver burden, you know, letting them know it's okay to reach out for help, you know, so th these three young kids are, you know, however old they are, um, I might need some help. Can you help me learn to cook a few easy things? Um, the other thing is, it, so, so that can be, you know, a, a simple thing, uh, just learning how to cook some very easy meals. But the other thing is that he'll need to learn how to take care of himself so that he doesn't burn out. And those are the most important things that caregivers can do is make sure they take time out for them at least once or twice a week to doing things with friends or if he golfs or whatever he might like to do. Because if you begin to really burn out, then you're not going to be much help to the person you're caring for. Um, there's probably plenty of people on here right now that feel just like that. And you feel maybe guilty that you're going out and taking care of yourself while your partner, your spouse, your um, can't. It doesn't matter. You have to be okay 
in order to care for somebody else. Um, so those are kind of some of the things that I, I would suggest. That's why the it's so important to talk and so important to have support groups because, you know, then you realize you're not alone. Again, that you're not alone with any of this stuff. A lot of people are feeling the same thing. Jeanette, how would you help somebody like this shift that perspective to one of like abundance that they have, you know, supports around them, that there's people that can help them, that there's people that want to help them, um, that it's, it's, it doesn't all fall on them. How would you help somebody, you know, shift their perspective like that? Well, I found this one a very difficult one as I was reading through it <clears throat> because, um, from my experience uh, as a counselor for quite a number of years, men do not want to reach out like women do. And I think that's the hard one right there is to get that past that. But as you know, everyone else has said, um, he needs to uh, sort of reach out in the community, find the resources that are there. Uh, other men, and even women uh, who have been through it, who are going through it, and see how they've coped with it to help him cope with it. And I think that it's, uh, as I say, I, I have failed over the years that it, even being in support groups that I've been in, men tend not to want to look for help. Hmm. They feel that they're, uh, it, they're not a man or whatever the way you want to call it, if they have to have help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I find that's the, the most difficult thing for him to get through. But he definitely needs to look out, guide himself, get resources, uh, do some self-care, go play golf, or curl, whatever he needs to do. And I think uh, one of the things that really struck me too was it says they raised three lovely kids who have now all recently moved out from home. Where have they moved to? Are they around? Will they take over and look after mom while he takes a day and goes somewhere? Because they can maybe the other two. Let's say he has three sons. One son stays home, the other two go with dad and have a day away with dad or whatever the combination may be. And it can be a family thing. And it might also be a day that mom can go too for whatever reason, even if it's just for a cup of coffee. And that can really help a lot. Yeah, it really speaks yeah. to the, the sort of caregiving role that can be played by those who maybe don't live in the same house as the, the right. PH. Yeah. And then yeah. it's almost a caregiving role for the caregiver, <laughs> in a sense. Like you yeah. say, this is the whole family um, has a role to play and has a responsibility for taking care of each other. So we yeah. do have a couple, thank you for that. Um, we have a couple of questions and, and I'm cognizant of time. So one, there was one question that was based on something you said early on, Car Carolyn, but it was relevant specifically to caregivers. And it was this question of the stress right now of the pandemic and, and managing sort of risk within our households. And the recommendation that you, you said that for, for folks, at least in your own clinic, uh, you're primarily recommending that people you know, avoid work, especially if that work involves crowds. Um, what about for caregivers? You know, caregivers have this sort of, you know, push and pull sometimes of a responsibility to their household by being outside the household. <laughs> so how do you, what, how does that advice sort of extend to caregivers and, and the, the added stress that they feel in these times? Yeah. Um, well, the caregivers obviously still need to work. Um, and, and, you know, if they can work from home, that's a good option. So if there's an option to work from home, the caregivers should work from home to minimize any bringing, you know, the germ, the, this virus into the household. If they have to get out of the home, you know, how to enter the home. So entering the home sort of, you know, it's some of this has been extreme um, with some of our patients where they just sort of, um, you know, take off the top layer and throw stuff into a bag and wash it right away, depending on where they work. So if they're working with, you know, in, in healthcare or a grocery store, you know, so, but if they're in an office, it may not be as extreme. So it depends on where they're working. Um, and, you know, you know, Purell right away, um, you know, so make sure that you're sort of not bringing in anything into the house. Um, so, so far, you know, we have told some people, if you have the option though, to stay home, to stay home. As far as kids going to school, 
we've 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 recommended that if you have young children and they're going into school we have recommended actually that the kids choose the online option if it's if it's mentally okay for the child we have said that right yeah and i think i'll just repeat sort of the recommendation that was made uh, much of the time in our back to school webinar and you know what i you know is often just that the circumstances are going to be very particular for for different families and so you know it's a conversation that often needs to be had directly with your team about what's going to be um best for your for your family and hopefully you know like you know jeanette said at the very beginning it's by by reaching out to your team and sort of having having as much information as possible is one of the things that can help us uh, you know, sort of feel like we're able to address some of these big, you know, problems and challenges that whether we have pH or not in our lives would be challenging for anybody to address. Um, so we do have another question that I'd like to try and address before we uh, start to move on to wrapping up. Uh, the question says, I have PAH as well as scleroderma, lymphoma, and other conditions, which means lots of doctor's appointments. Quite often, I feel down after visits because things don't seem to get any better, and I feel like I'm wasting my time, theirs and mine. I'm not listened to. It often takes days to get out of the rut. I feel like journaling is a good idea, but I'm not sure it will be enough. Suggestions? Jeanette, or it was you that mentioned journaling, um, and I know that as somebody, you also live with multiple health conditions, and you know, this cycle of going, of depression there or, or blues that can come from attending medical appointments. Is that something you relate to? Yes, sorry. Yes, Jeanette, sorry. Um, really, uh, to be honest with you, I don't relate to that <laughs> because I find my, uh, my team is extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, they're all together. I started off by going to the PAH clinic where my rheumatologist for my scleroderma was mm -hmm. part of that team as well. So everybody knows exactly where I stand in all things. They work from one file. So to be honest with you, I have not experienced that. So having that coordination of care really has actually helped alleviate some of that stress for you. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I know that if I talk to my PH respirologist, he knows exactly what my rheumatologist has done, who's a scleroderma specialist, because they all work, as I say, from the same file. Yeah. And it, it, that, that is really helpful. And if that can be coordinated more for her, I think that would be extremely helpful. Yeah. I yeah. know it's not always possible everywhere, but right. for me, I find it, it has helped, because then it, 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 I don't have the worry about having to go and tell somebody everything that's going on that the last person said. Mm -hmm. I just know that they already know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Joanne, um, you know, that's not this person's experience right no. now, unfortunately. No. And they're also dealing with that feeling that, you know, their situation is not improving. Um, any, any suggestions for a person feeling like this right now? Like, that's really hard. Yeah. You, that's a lot of stuff to go through and process. Um, do you have a support person to come with you to these meetings? Um, I'd like to know a bit more about when she says she doesn't feel like she's being listened to. Um, you know, what is that about? But maybe trying to come up with like something that she has to look forward to after these um, kind of upsetting appointments, like knowing, okay, she's going to go for coffee with a friend or she's getting her nails done, or she's going to take a soothing bubble bath, like something that she has to look forward to, to know, you know, this may be crappy, but after this, I've got something good coming up. Um, but yeah, I don't blame you for feeling down. This is a lot of stuff to process and it's not fair. Yeah. No. no. Anything final to add, Carolyn? Um, no, I don't think so. Everybody's sort of in general, <laughs> or uh, well, or, yeah. No, if you'd like to give us a, a parting word, uh, I please feel free. Although I, I'm happy to wrap up as well. 
I have nothing further. Like, I mean, everybody sort of said some really, uh, a lot of really good suggestions and a lot of really good, uh, um, you know, conversations here today. So that was, that was great. Thank you very much. I, I feel like I heard three really important themes from you. I feel like, you know, one of, one of the most important things we can do is, is find those practical supports, you know, that part of the stress, um, and the anxiety that is produced for people is coming from just the reality that life is hard and that there's really hard things going on and that we need help to address those things. So finding those practical supports, you know, asking for help is, is a big part of addressing the mental health burden as well. The second mm -hmm. thing I heard is just, is, is about the importance of, of talking and connecting with others. So that, you know, that, you know, we talked about support groups, but, you know, whether that be online or, or, you know, in a, in a formal support group or, or even just having that emotional support in your life and then tapping into it, not being afraid to put yourself out there and to really tap into that, which can be really hard for some people. Uh, and then the third thing I heard was around the importance of self-care. And I think, you know, we, you know, that can be a bit of a term that loses its meaning sometimes, but at the same time, you know, there are so many ways that it can be done in a way that works for us, right? It's like, there's actually a lot of room to be creative in how we take care of, of ourselves. Um, it can really be everything from like the basics of getting enough sleep and, you know, eating well. And like Carolyn said, like getting as much exercise as we can tolerate, um, that that can be a form of self-care, that, you know, setting boundaries and having healthy relationships can be a form of self-care, that having a therapist can be a form of self-care, that, you know, scheduling a bubble bath or coffee with a friend after a medical appointment is a form of self-care, that these are all ways that we can care for ourselves um, when life is hard. Because, yeah, I think, you know, Joanne, you, you said it perfectly, like, it's hard and it's unfair. So... We accept, you know, if we can accept that, then what are some things that we can do to, uh, to live through those moments together? So thank you very much to each of you. We're going to just uh, turn it over to Sally for just a minute. We don't want to end a session like this without uh, pointing people in the direction of some resources. So uh, I'm going to invite Sally to turn her camera on. And uh, for those of you who have not yet met Sally, uh, Sally is our new education programs coordinator. She was responsible for uh, doing much of the organizing and coordinating of this session. So thank you very much, Sally. And she is going to introduce us to the handout. So I will, I'll bring it up, Sally, and you go ahead and uh, start talking about it. Okay, so yeah, hi everyone. My name is Sally, and as you may know, as Jim, Jamie said, I'm the new uh, education program coordinator um, at PHA Canada, and also as a family member of someone who also lives with PH, I'm really like excited and happy to join and work for this PH community. So uh, speaking of this, we would like to mention this mental health resource handout. Um, it's an expert from our latest summer edition connection magazines, which including three uh, very important parts. So let me just share my screen or oh, Jamie do. Uh, oh, I, I already have. Can folks see the handout on my screen? Um, I see, yeah, I see some nodding heads. So you think okay, you can... Okay, okay. Um, then great. Yeah, we try to uh, provide some useful mental health resource to help you manage your emotion, especially during this pandemic. So it including three important parts. First is an emotional wellness handbook for pH patient. And second, the link for medi uh, meditation resources posted on our pH blog. Feel free to check it out. And third is the uh, chronic illness counseling resources. And there are also some other resources link for caregiver and the healthcare providers, as we just talked about how important, um, you know, it is for a caregiver to handle and manage their mental health. And so feel free to have a look of those links. This handout um, is also available on our website under the uh, resource section. So feel, um, when after this webinar, you can just go and have a look in both English and French. We will also send all of you a link to it uh, in our follow up Zoom webinar. So yeah, hope it could be a useful tool for all of you. Great. Thanks so much, Sally. So I right, just want to put it out to the group to see if there's any more questions or comments from our audience today. 
So I'll just give everybody a moment. Um, like Sally said, you're going to get an email after today's session that's going to include a link to two things. It's going to include a link to a, an evaluation survey. We would really appreciate your feedback on today's session. It only takes uh, like a, a two minutes to fill out. It's very brief. Um, so uh, you'll get a link to that. And then in the same email, you'll get a link to the handout that we just showed you and that Sally has mentioned is available right on our website. So you'll get, and it's available in both English and in French. Uh, and of course, if you have not received the most recent issue of Connections Magazine, please make sure to reach out to us or you can pick it up at your clinic. Um, if you are a person living Living with pH or been diagnosed with pH, yay, there's Joanne's got it right there, um, then uh, you are entitled to a free lifetime subscription or perhaps you're a caregiver or live with somebody who has pH, your household's entitled to a free subscription. So please make sure you reach out to us and get uh, signed up for that. If you have other follow-up questions following this session, please do feel free to reach out to Sally and I and Laurence as well at, at the office. We are here for you always, as Carolyn said, um, you know, you, you know, none of you are on this journey alone. Uh, there is a whole community of people behind you and, uh, and here at PHA Canada, you know, we, um, you know, we are here to help make you feel part of that community to help you connect with that community and so you know for those of you who expressed interest in um, setting up some support group sessions or you know maybe you just want to host a one-time thing online um, I will follow up with those of you that I heard from and uh, anybody else is welcome to reach out to me of course anytime we look forward to helping to connect you and on that note I'll just say that uh, stay tuned because we've got some in addition to the two more sessions coming up as part of the fall education series so those are going to be a session on the first Friday Friday of, of November and the first Friday of December, one on nutrition and one on pH treatments. In addition to that, we've got a whole calendar of events planned for November Awareness Month, uh, including an opportunity to connect online with your peers then as well. So lots of things coming up. Thank you very, very much to Sally for organizing and of course um, to Joanne and to Jeanette and to Carolyn for all their insights uh, today. Um, I, you know, you may not feel like an expert all the time, uh, but uh, we really, really appreciate everything that you shared with us today. Um, so I, uh, I thank you very much. This session is being recorded. Oh yeah, the final poll. Oh, thank you, I almost forgot. There we go, Sally's put up the poll. If everybody wouldn't mind just taking the last minute to please answer the question, we would really appreciate it. Um, and- uh, Thanks so much, Jamie. Oh, you're welcome, you're thank welcome. You. And uh, I think I'm just gonna check the questions to see if there was anything. Yeah, I was just gonna say about the recording as people are voting in the poll, I'll just say about the recording that uh, you will receive a link to the recording as well. And for those folks, your friends, you maybe weren't able to make it today, they will be able to, uh, to um, they'll get a link to the recording as well. And then eventually we'll post it online as well. All right, so I don't see any other comments or questions. So let's end the poll and see how people are feeling. Great, we've got um, people feeling just a, a little bit better about things after after today's conversation. And I think that's, you know, that was part of uh, part of our objective, right? Is to just uh, give our chance, give ourselves a chance to uh, take care of each other in this moment and hopefully leave feeling a little bit um, better prepared to face the world around us. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time today. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks so much, Jeanette. Thank you, Jeanette. Thanks. I'm going to leave the webinar now. Jamie. Okay, bye, Sally.